take a look at this clip of Mr. Link's stomach from 2019's Missing Link. What makes this clip so special is what's underneath Mr. Link's silicone body. This little skeleton or armature is what allows him to be so animated, almost as if he was a hand-drawn character that's able to squash and stretch. To help us understand how we've gotten up to this point are some people who've worked at Leica and made tons of stop-motion movies, like my personal favorite, Paranorman. Before we dive into the animation of our favorite characters, let's first explain how a stop-motion movie is made. To make a stop-motion movie, we take our character or object and take a picture. There then move, and another picture is taken. When these images are shown in succession, we get a movie. Now that we know how to make a stop-motion movie, let's look at what's happening inside of our character. Some parts are inherently easy to grasp, like the movement of the body, which is done with ball and socket joints. But there are still parts that need more control. Animators need to be able to animate the smallest parts of the character, like the eyebrows or the mouth, and also somehow be able to animate the squash and stretch of a character. But since there's been so many advancements with these armatures, let's start with something relatively simple, the hands and feet, and then we'll work our way up. They're both usually created from wire, and when bent will retain that shape. They're also both typically small, and because of that they lack detail, which can cause some issues in close-ups. So, to add detail, animators sometimes create huge hands. I think when you see like a close-up of a hand in a film, usually it's a hand that's much bigger than like a like this hand. It's usually a hand that's like almost as big as our hands, essentially. One other method to get that detail is to replace the small hands with 3D printed hands. Since the hands and feet are usually made from wire that can break, the character's extremities are usually built to be replaced. Because of that mechanism, you can also 3D print some hands without having huge armatures, and animators can get those sharp contours that you wouldn't be able to get with a typical wire hand. This is called the replacement method, which brings us to the face, where it's used most often. There are two ways of animating the face. Replacement faces allow CG sculptors to create and print individual face shapes so an animator can attach them magnetically to the core of the character's head. The only problem with replacement faces is that you need thousands of faces for each movie. On Missing Link, there were 106,000 faces printed, one for almost every single frame of the movie. So to combat this issue, a fully articulated head was created. You can see one of the earlier ones in Corpse Bride. The new faces use small ball and socket joints, which allow fine control of the mouth and the eyebrow region. This was the way that Pinocchio's Geppetto was animated. You know, the first film I worked on was Tim Burton's Corpse Bride, where it was mechanical faces, you know, with mm -hmm. the rigs inside. And then some of the more advanced ones we've used um, had a thing where you would put like an Allen wrench through the ear and it would activate like uh, a pulley system so that you could then pull the corners of the mouths up. So if you wanted a smile, you could do that. The problem with those is like they will only go as far as Firstly, the joint will allow you to, but also the silicone will only stretch a certain amount. The reason animators stray away from silicone heads is because the silicone can't stretch too much, or else it'll tear. But you can get that stretch from printed faces, since their faces are printed and don't need to be adjusted in any way. Awesome! And it's one of the main reasons that we still use replacement faces. On some of the newer movies, there have been a lot of advancements in giving the character as a whole the ability to squash and stretch. So with... Susan in Missing Link, it was a big round character that, you know, in CG or in drawn animation, you could easily get lots of like squash and stretch. But with some motion, you're kind of stuck with like this solid lump of silicon or, you know, whatever you use. So we really wanted to try and like add as much squash and stretch into this thing as possible. Right in the middle, we kind of like connected this winder where you would poke like an allen wrench through i can't remember i think it was through his belly button or something like that um, and find like a little key inside and you could wind it and it would essentially stretch the body up and down also this type of technology wasn't only used on susan from missing link you can go as far back as paranorman where neil had a belly mover that would push his stomach giving the illusion of breathing before these newer movies animators had to work with the constraints of the character a perfect example of this is Jack Skellington from Nightmare Before Christmas. He'd bend down all the way and explode into a pose. That's a form of squash and stretch. If you pose the puppets in a way so they look shorter, and then when you really want that stretch, you pose them in a way they look longer to camera. So you're, like, you're sort of using the, the fact that you're, lo you're looking at a 2D image on a screen, but you are, you are working in the 3D universe, so you can make things shorter and you can make it longer just by moving it towards camera so 
So even if you don't have the ability to actually stretch your puppet, you could still think about the principle of squats and stretch and then try to put it in there. For a character like Jack Skellington, it might be easier to squash and stretch since he's tall and lanky. But for rounder characters, that's more difficult. Even getting large characters to bend over is a difficult thing to do, let alone squash and stretch. The sheer amount of material surrounding a round character is a lot more than a character like Jack Skellington or even Oogie Boogie. Though there has been some work recently to try to fix this issue. How do you get, how do you get this to bend at the waist, right? Um, so like Mr. His name, Mr. Gristle, they changed this character's name in Box Trolls. I think it's Mr. Gristle in the movie, but, uh, you know, it's sort of a potato and there was no point in putting like two spine joints in this thing. It was never going to bend. I ended up just kind of cutting it in half and the top half of the puppet rises around the bottom half. There's a couple of characters in that movie where we just, because it was such a big ball, we made part of the puppet go inside the other part. And, and the top half would ride around on top. As a side note, this was used for the nun in Wendell and Wild. Anyways, to get Squash and Stretch to work for these types of characters, either the character has to have less material like Oogie Boogie or Susan, or the movements have to be exaggerated like Mr. Trout. Of course, the new armatures really help in this. Because of these advancements, stop motion has become far more lifelike and easier to get into. All you need is a phone and a character. And you don't need the fanciest armatures. Mine was only $30, and you don't even need that. All you need is some wire or even a Lego character. One thing I do want to shout out is Inkwo, which is a stop motion short film that Patrick has been working on. Check it out if you can. Malcolm also has a YouTube channel all about stop motion you guys should definitely check out. If you do want to get started in stop motion animation, I've left a bunch of resources that can help you out. All of them helped me make my minion puppet. I also wanted to give a special thank you to Brian, Malcolm, Patrick, and William. They were amazing. They taught me so much that there's an upcoming episode talking more about stop motion. But that's enough for this episode. Thank you guys for watching and bye.